Hi, my name is Yaba Beidou. I'm the author of The Secret of the Purple Lake. And I'm really pleased that you're with me here in my garden to um, support the Read the World initiative in collaboration with the International Publicists Association, uh, the World Health Organization and UNICEF, the UN Fund for Children. During this time of COVID, when we're supposed to keep um, away from people we don't live with, it's really, really important to be healthy in your mind and your body. There are all sorts of things to keep healthy in your body, like washing your hands and so on. But keeping healthy in your mind usually involves reading books, because in books you can travel all over the world. And although you may miss your friends at the moment, um, you can make new friends in books. Anyway, I'm going to read from my book soon, but um, if there's anything you want to ask me or if you want to take part in this initiative, Read the World, use the hashtag Read the World uh, if you're able to get online. Make your comments and I'll try to get back to you if I can. All right? I'm going to read from The Secret of the Purple Lake, a collection of fairy stories. I'll read from the opening story, which is called the fisherman's daughter. A long time ago, during the days of the Ghana Empire, there lived a girl named Ajiba, whose house was by the sea. Ajiba lived with her father, her mother, and her brother, but it was her father she loved best of all. He was called the man with silver nets, because every time he went out to sea, he returned with nets teeming with fish. Early one morning, when Ajiba should have been helping her mother light the fire to cook breakfast, she followed her father to the seashore. Can't I come with you this time, she pleaded, gazing up at her father. Please, Pa, I'll help you throw your nets into the ocean, and if water comes into your boat, I'll bail it out for you. But who will help your mother if you come with me? Ajiba didn't know what to say. She didn't enjoy helping her mother clean and gut fish, not to mention the other household chores she avoided whenever she could. Chores such as sweeping the yard and washing her brother's clothes. I'd rather be out at sea with you, Pa, Ajiba mumbled. She was about to dawdle back home when her father grabbed her hands and swung her round and round, making the sea and sky whirl around her. Would you like me to throw you to the fishes, her father teased. Yes, Ajiba screamed, throw me into the sea and I'll swim alongside your boat and fill your net with snappers. One of these days I'm going to give in to you, my girl. Ajiba's father put her down on the ground. When she tried to stand up, she staggered from side to side and toppled on her bottom like an old woman drunk on palm wine. Before he set off, the man with silver nets rubbed a special lotion of coconut oil on his skin for protection against any danger he might encounter out at sea. The shark's tooth he wore around his neck for good luck shone and his skin glistened as he pushed the canoe into the water. He leapt into the boat, paddling on one side and then the other until the only thing he could see was a speck on the shore waving at him his daughter, Ajiba. That evening, around dusk, when the heat of the day rested like a moist blanket on the sea, the village women helped the fishermen drag in their nets. Ajiba and her mother waited for her father. Perhaps he went out far this time, her mother said, to find us deep water fish. But twilight came, and still there was no sign of the man with silver nets. Ajiba and her mother huddled together, scanning the sea for his canoe. Apart from tiny crabs scuttling about their feet and the sound of frogs croaking in the lagoon, everything was quiet. At midnight, Ajiba's brother came out of the family house to join his mother and sister, for there was still no sign of the fishermen. At daybreak, just as a breeze rustled the palm trees and the sea began to stir, three crows shattered the morning calm. They flew screaming through a coconut grove and circled the family hut. The birds perched on the roof, but then, flapping their wings, they leapt up and down as if the roof was alight with flames. The villagers ran out to see what was happening. 
Ajiba's mother flung coconut husks to the birds to keep them away from the hut, but they returned cawing, an omen of death in the family. It was then that one of the villagers pointed to the sea. There, on the milky horizon, was the fisherman's black canoe coming home with the tide. The canoe was empty. Life changed in the village. The cocks stopped crowing, hens stopped laying eggs, and children sickened beneath the noonday sun. Then, one after the other, tethered goats disappeared, and snakes, which had once only come out in the moonlight, flaunted themselves by day. Over seven months, the village fishermen caught nothing but tiny fish. Mangoes dropped green from trees, and children spat out fruit poisoned by maggots. One evening, a cloud of vultures dropped seeds over the village farmlands. The next day, giant thistles sprung up and choked the ripening corn. Everyone grew lean. On the advice of the oldest man in the village, the community decided to seek help from Nana, an old woman who lived at the edge of the forest. Nana was as gnarled and thin as the trees that twisted around her hut, and her face was wrinkled like a tiger nut. She understood the ways of forest folk and could work their magic well. It was said that she could whistle dwarves down from trees, and once, a long time ago, she had danced with leopards under a full moon. A delegation led by the old man went to see Nana. After they described their troubles, she withdrew to sit beneath an nim tree, the most ancient tree in her compound. Nana gently hummed to herself, and when all around her was still, opened her cloudy eyes. Just as the forest claimed me, she began in a low musical voice, so the sea must have its daughter. What do you mean? the old man asked. The child the sea wants, Nana explained, is the daughter of the man with silver nets. His spirit cannot rest until his bones are brought to land for burial. Only then would the village know peace and prosperity again. Ajiba's mother wept when the villagers came to take her child away. Ajiba clung to her mother, screaming, I want to stay with mummy. I'll cook and clean. I'll do everything you want to, won't I, mummy? This girl is my only daughter, her mother cried. You can't take her. I forbid it. Deaf to their protests, the villagers prized Ajiba's fingers from her mother's waist. The woman dropped to the ground and rubbing dust over her face cursed the villagers for their wickedness. The old man tried to soothe her by wiping her brow clean and reassuring her that Kwame, greatest of all the gods who created heaven and earth and everything on land and sea, would watch over Ajiba. But the woman cursed each and every one of the people who tore her daughter from her arms. That night, Ajiba was given one of Nana's potions to drink. She fell into a deep sleep in which she dreamed that hyenas carried her for miles along the seashore. When she awoke, she found herself alone on a strange beach. She would have cried had it not been for the reassuring sound of the sea calling her name. The child replied by paddling along the shoreline and picking up brightly colored shells. She was so absorbed in the purple, pink and gold shells that she didn't notice the sea changing. In a matter of seconds, it receded a mile down the shore. Then it yawned, turning into the mouth of a gigantic hippopotamus about to swallow the world. Ajiba dropped the shells. She was about to scream when she heard Nana's voice telling her not to be frightened. But as the enormous wave curled around her and swallowed her deep down to its belly at the bottom of the sea, she yelled, terrified, convinced that she was tumbling to her death. If you want to know what happens next, you'll have to buy the book and read it.